want to. <clears throat> I just want to tell you what an incredible honor it is for me to interview you. Oh, thanks. I am just amazed to be here. I have to ask, do you have a favorite piece or favorite book? Well, I always say I do, and then I think of another one that actually is my favorite. Um, depends on the mood I'm in. I, there are times I would say the Greenlanders is, is my favorite. Um, when I got out of college and started writing, I, I was an English major, had an English PhD, specialized in medieval literature, and I wanted to write an epic, a comedy, a tragedy, and a romance. I wanted to, to try all of those. And so I did set out to do that. The tragedy was King Lear. Um, I mean, the tragedy was A Thousand Acres, the comedy was Moo, the romance was The All True Travels and Adventures of Liddy Newton, which is about the Kansas troubles before the Civil War, and the epic was The Greenlanders. Um, and I just wanted to do that because I knew instinctively that I was more of a curious and inquisitive person than I was a sort of straightforward person. And, and I also feel that every form has its good things and its bad things. And if you're a novelist, you're looking at a particular set of circumstances or a particular story through the lens of that particular form. But you can't help wanting to have some of that other stuff. So you really can't have a lot of comedy in a tragedy. Um, you can't have a lot of horrifying death in a comedy. So you get dissatisfied with that particular form. So I would just toss aside that lens and go on the next one. to the next one. And I, I truly enjoyed it. And then I got to Horse Heaven. And in Horse Heaven, I wanted to put all the forms in. So I gave each racehorse, um, there are six of them, I gave each of them a fate that adheres to a particular genre. Um, That's neat. Yeah, it was, and that was true, totally fun. How do you get started on a story, and how long does it take you to like formulate your idea and have it grow? Well, for the first part of my career, I, I always said I had all the ideas at once. They, I had them all um, around the time I was in Iceland, late in my graduate school career. Um, and so for the next 15 or 20 years, I just wrote out those ideas um, that I'd already had. Um, then, then I had to come up with some new ideas. But, you know, novel ideas aren't that hard to come up with. Uh, you, you can only write. I, I always say poets and fiction, poets and short story writers are the ones who are really creative. Novelists are really kind of plotters, you know? They like to think the same thoughts day after day after day. So, do you so many ideas aren't hard to come up with. Okay, I read in an interview that you said, when you detach yourself, as soon as you are observing from a state of detachment, then you are in the realm of irony. Then you are moving toward the realm of the, the comic, because irony is about being detached. How do you do that? I would think that many people find becoming detached a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. And do you think about it, and you, do you do it consciously? Well, I think actually um, humor is a part of your temperament, uh, or maybe a part of the way you grew up in your family. And so most of the people I meet who can tell a good joke or who have a good sense of humor, that just comes naturally to them. And it sort of comes naturally to me. In my family, they always work telling some joke or other. And you had to, and usually the joke was on you. If you were a kid, you were being teased, and um, you had to be able to laugh along, or they didn't consider you a good sport. So whether by training or by, um, by temperament, um, I've always really appreciated humor and jokes. But the humorist really has to be able to step back, to understand First of all, a pattern. Humor is about a pattern that gets broken momentarily. And the, and the moment it gets broken is a little bit of a surprise, and then people are kind of bumped into laughing at it. Um, but, um, you, but there are lots of forms of humor. Uh, you know, people's appreciation of humor is extremely idiosyncratic. So what may seem really tame to somebody seems really cruel to somebody else. 
And what may seem really funny to somebody seems really flat to somebody else. It's much more different. It's much different than, say, tragedy. Most people respond to tragedy basically in the same way. So lots of times a humorist ends up being the only person in the room laughing, but in some sense it's humor is its own reward. So, you know, so what if you never get big? You had a wonderful time That's laughing right. all those That's years. Right. That's right. <laughs> so when you were writing The Greenlanders, you said you began to see your writing in a completely different way and to see it as not a possession of yours, but as something that came to you and then went away from you. And you described it as a lake or a river or an ocean of material that you dipped into that was always there. Always there. So you never experienced writer's block or periods where inspiration is hard for you to find? I did experience writer's block once um, in 1994. Um, and it was because I got really interested in horses and I stopped thinking about riding. But then I fell off my horse and broke my leg, so. Oh, good um, job. That was good, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I started thinking about riding in addition to horses. But then once I had assimilated the horse stuff, then I was able to put it all uh, together in the same day. Um, for me, the main source of inspiration is curiosity. It's, oh, I was, I was one of those kids, we all have one in our family, who never stops asking questions until finally he or she is sent over to the corner and told to be quiet. And I was that kid. Um, and so I sort of have remained that kid. I get, just get interested in stuff and I want to find out about it. And um, part of my finding out about it is to uh, organize it and write about it. Once you write about it, you, once you start writing about it, let's put it that way, you realize what you know and what you don't know, so you go find out more and then you realize how it connects. Um, writing the Greenlanders is a perfect example of that. I was living in Iceland, I was on a Fulbright, um, and I met a guy, who, a Scottish guy, who said, did I know? And I had read all the um, Icelandic sagas, or most of them, but he said, did I know anything about the Greenlander, or about the, the Norse colony in Greenland? And I thought, no, I really didn't. And he was a sailor, and he said that if you fell out of the boat in Greenland, you'd freeze to death instantly. I don't know if that's true or not. But that sort of piqued my you curiosity. Never tested the theory. No, I never, never tested it. Okay. But that piqued my curiosity. So that's the sort of thing that would happen. I would get cur I would get curious about something, and then as I investigated, I would get more curious about it. Okay. So you once also said that you believe that challenge in the workplace leads to a greater drive, and following inner passion is essential to happiness. So how do you keep yourself challenged, and where does your drive come from? Well, I have horses, and horses are expensive, so <laughs> a lot of drive should, sh does and should come from the desire to earn money. I mean, the desire to express yourself gets you pretty far, and the desire to investigate um, gets you pretty far, but the, accelerated, the accelerator pedal is the knowledge that you're depending on your work for a living. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to write a lot. I was fascinated um, to listen to the two guys who I could not see up here yesterday. So I don't even know who they were, Jim Strauss and somebody else. Who was the other one? That was um, Rob Ludham. He was the director and the writer and, and no, the director and producer of the movie that we were screening. Oh, I see. Or, okay. Trailer. And they were bemoaning. They were saying how Hollywood writers hate to be writing. They're always alone. You know, it's a terrible life to be sitting in a room alone. And for a fiction writer, you're never alone. You're in your, there with your characters. And I don't ever feel isolated or alone. I feel um, full of voices and full of life. And so. Um, I, I really do think that uh, you, you can enjoy the rewards, you can be the kind of person who enjoys the rewards, or you can be the kind of person who enjoys the process. If you are the kind of person who enjoys the rewards, then you will live a tragic life, because there are never enough awards 
um, to make you feel good. Um, or to make it continue to feel good. If you're the kind of person who enjoys the process, then you will live a very happy life because the process itself is your reward and um, it, it, it enhances your feeling of being alive, of being curious, of, be, of knowing things, of finding out things. And you know, you may turn around and somebody will say to you when you're 85 years old, you know, it's too bad you were such a failure. But in your own life, in your own mind, and in your own life, you weren't a failure at all. You were a person who was always engaged and in passion. Yeah. Do you ever stop and think about how many people's lives that you've touched, and what is the most curious, amazing, or funny thing that someone has ever said to you about how your work affected their life? I never think about how many lives I've touched because I have no way of knowing that. You, I, I cannot experience my own self from the outside. So. Amazon will count for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, so so I've just so years ago I decided not even to try to do that. But I did have a funny thing happen that sticks in my mind. Um, I was flying from uh, Monterey to New York through San Francisco. And the plane out of Monterey leaves really early in the morning, it was 5.30 or 6. So I got up really early, got on the plane, got to San Francisco. Um, and when I was on the plane from San Francisco to New York, I fell asleep. And I sort of leaned over like this and leaned over like this. And finally, about an hour into the flight, the woman next to me started laughing. And I woke up and I, my eyes opened and I saw that she was reading Moo. And she was laughing. <laughs> and I, I was so I was so happy. And I said, oh, that's my book. And she said, no, it isn't. <laughs> I said, yeah, it is. And she said, I bought it. I bought it in the bookstore. I said, no, I wrote it. She looked at me and said, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I already did. I wrote it. <laughs> Did you eventually she sign did not her? believe me. No? She did not believe me, and I was a little too shy to press it. You didn't turn the cover to the back with the picture? No, I, you know, I'm a girl from the Midwest. I didn't push it, you know. But I always thought that was the best compliment that I ever got was that she was laughing. That's amazing. Uh, okay, now I have a, uh, a hard question for you. You have a passion for writing, and you have a passion for riding. And if you had to give one of those things up, which would be the hardest? I'd kill myself. What? Oh, okay, you don't away. have to give up. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I don't think I would. I don't know. No, I just no. wouldn't address that choice. Okay. Don't make another hard question that you have to answer instead. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure that everyone asks you this. You've probably answered it before. How did it feel when you heard you were nominated for a Pulitzer Prize? And you never hear that you're nominated. Oh, you don't? No, that's a secret. Okay, so how or did you feel when you heard you know. won? Um, the story was when I won, um, my 14-year-old daughter was staying home from school that day, and she was 14, you know, she was absolutely impervious to any positive uh, ideas of her mom. And, <laughs> So we were sitting at the kitchen table, and the phone rang, and it was a woman from the Ames, Ames Tribune in Iowa, and she said, um, what would you say if you, were, if you were to find out that you won a Pulitzer Prize? And I said, have I won the Pulitzer Prize? She said, but if, if you were that you had won the Pulitzer Prize, what would you say? So I gave some kind of quote. Um, and I went off to school lit for the afternoon class. And at 2 o'clock um, that afternoon, the phone rang immediately in my office. And that was at that time when st stuff went out on the web, on the um, AP and all of those things by, fat, by a lawyer called Wire, yeah. And that's when the phone started to ring, and they said, a guy from the Washington Post called me and said, you won the Pulitzer Prize. And I had said to my daughter, when I got off the phone, I said, honey, I think I won the Pulitzer Prize. And she went, huh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> totally unimpressed, right? 
So, um, so I was fielding all these calls on the, on the phone in my office at school, and then I heard this scream of a person running down this aisle of my, um, the hallway? Uh, well, the hall, yeah, the hallway of our office building, screaming. And I opened the door and I looked out, and it was the Ames Stringer for the Des Moines Tribune, and she was holding the Ames Tribune in her, for the Des Moines Register, and she was holding the Ames Tribune in her hand, reading an article about me winning the Pulitzer Prize. So the Ames Tribune had beat the Des Moines Register, had <laughs> the Des Moines Register, and she was furious. And what had happened was that the guy um, who was the overall overseer of all the Pulitzers happened to own the Ames Tribune, oh. even though he worked for NBC. And he had given them the word, and they had called me to get a quote so that he could get, him, get it in the paper that afternoon, rather than let the register walk all over them for the millionth time. So he was really happy, I bet. He was really happy. Yeah, that was, so that was fun. That yeah. was fun. But how did you feel? I felt excited. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the time I said, you know, when you win the Pulitzer, you go from a wannabe to a has-been. And that's because you're no longer cool. You know, you're no longer outside the establishment. You're no longer a beat poet or whatever it was. Now you're within the establishment. But I was never cool to begin with. And so, <laughs> so sure. it was fine with me to win it. And I liked it. But I was also. 16 weeks pregnant or eight weeks pregnant, some kind of degree of pregnancy. So I didn't have to run around and go to a lot of things because I was throwing up all the time anyway. <laughs> so um, I remember meeting um, Michael Cunningham, who went, when he won the Pulitzer, just went wherever they asked him, you know, and really enjoyed himself for a year. But he had, didn't do any writing that year either. So it took him a while to get back into his, his writing life because he enjoyed the Pulitzer so much. Do you think it adds pressure to you that now that you've done this that you like, have to like keep at that level or? No. No. Because now you've done it, you've, you've you can't arrived. You can't do it. You can't do it. You have to say the, I mean, I was already halfway into Moo, which is completely different from A Thousand Acres. So my focus was on Moo. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a novel, it was a comic novel, rather. it was the comedy as opposed to the tragedy. And I was enjoying the comedy, so there was no question that I would reproduce the tragedy anyway. Right. So I want to thank you very much for this, a great and honor, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me.